I'm Jennifer Branch. Today I'm going to show you how to paint a gorgeous Venice bridge. This is a classic light surrounded by dark, cool colors surrounding warm colors composition. Let's paint. Let's paint. I'm starting off with quinacridone gold. It has that wonderful glowing effect. I'm using rough pressed paper because Venice has this wonderful texture to it. It um, has a oh, rough stucco and stonework, and I'll be able to do some hit or miss on the stonework where it just kind of glazes the surface, and there's little areas that don't get covered, and with the rough texture of the paper, that really shows to advantage. I'm doing a basic warm colors surrounding by cool color composition. So the warm colors are going to pull you down the um, canal. I'm going to do dark surrounding light. So between the warm and the cool, you're going to feel like you're in the shade of the buildings and it's going to pull you. Oh, you want to go down that bridge, down the canal. I've been using a lot of the maroon perillon lately. It's a kind of in-between deep rich red. It's good when you don't want things a little too hot like a quinacridone red it is a little translucent and a little pink and um, my other option would be burnt sienna and that's very grainy which I'll be using later in this but right there I want the deep rich red. I am just going into the um, composition all over it with the same quinacridone gold. Then I used the um, ultramarine pink and the maroon perillon. And I just continue to use the same colors for the, most of the painting, really. It's layer upon layer. Ultramarine pink is this is a very grainy dividing color. It it um leads to interesting textures. And here's some ultramarine blue. Deep rich dark. Easy. It doesn't have any bad features unless you put it on too heavy in the first wash. It needs to be done in multiple layers, otherwise it turns a little gluey and chalky looking. I like splattering clean water on paintings. It doesn't work for every painting, of course, but if you want to kind of loosen things up and you have some hit or miss colors, perfect. It um, lets you not be too serious about the painting. Because painting is not serious. It's a glimpse at a wonderful moment. And, you know, you can't be too precise. A little bit of clean water freshens things up. And remember, clean water. There's no point in pre-mudding your painting. Remember, if something's on one side of an object, check very carefully whether it needs to be on the other side of the object, because usually it does. building things up in layers. Don't try for the heavy darks your first go. You want some deep darks, but you don't want sludge on your painting. See how it's the same colors? Just moving them around the painting. And you thought that the ultramarine blue was pretty deep the first time round, but even with just a minute or two of settling, it um, dries just enough where you can add that other layer. I haven't paused for any drying breaks. It's just moving around the painting the whole time. Things dry just enough so you can add that extra layer without being bone dry. Of course, there are going to be some things that need to be bone dry before you add something on top of them. And I'll mention it when they when you do. 
another color introduced in, the phthalo green, that's going to kind of dull down the blues and the reds. And in those deep shadows with the watery depths of the canal, I want pretty dull color because it really isn't about the color of the canal in this particular painting. It's about the color of the buildings and the reflections and the pulling into the painting in the fridge with no railings that looks just like it's floating above the water and all this colorful life. It's very exciting. <laughs> Easy below all those wonderful balconies, there's bound to be a shadow, and so shadows are going to be richer, usually cooler, not always, but usually cooler versions of what's around them. see how that rough pressed paper really that comes into its own on something like the textured brickwork I'm not going to be drawing every brick I think that would be distracting in this particular painting now there's some paintings where the texture of each and every paint brick would be very important this isn't one of them the this the bridge is a path but um, the hit or miss colors doing that very easily um, the natural brushes make a big difference with that too. This one's a sable, but um, for hit or miss, squirrel or sable, either one works beautifully. A lot of times I'm just kind of smudging around colors on my palette. It's mostly phthalo green. I'm not mixing it really on my palette. I'm just getting some color because something very light like the stairs will have all sorts of colors in it so you don't want exactly the same thing every time because it's going to reflect different objects you don't want to say oh well it's marble so they're all bluey gray and let me mix up this on my palette and paint everything the same they're not the same the light changes them dramatically besides the whole natural stone thing. Quinacridone gold is a fabulous color. You can use it light and it dries to that beautiful golden color. And then you can put a little bit more in and it mixes in these exciting patterns with everything around it. I use it in most of my paintings. <laughs> now if you're mixing a cool into warm colors, remember you don't want to mix too many colors in there. Um, that's three. I would very strongly suggest beginners stay at three colors um, at a time in an area of course not in the entire painting but since you're working the, that limited palette around your painting it works you can get very different effects from the same range of colors And see how I'm not, I'm, I'm just dropping colors in really so they, they do what they want to do. That's the excitement of watercolor. Um, you don't want to just uh, keep going in and going in and scrubbing them so that they're mixed really thoroughly and you get a uniform cut. That's not exciting. That um, doesn't have the variation that there is in real life with interesting light hitting things in different places and all sorts of stuff. Now I still have not gotten enough cools or darks in this painting. We still don't have that feeling of going into sort of out of a tunnel and into the sun. 
One thing that surprised me about Venice was how crooked the buildings were. I mean, I know they were built on a swamp and it would, the entire gorgeous city rests on basically logs hammered into the mud centuries and centuries ago. But I don't think there was a straight edge in it. Okay, what you missed there was the um, quinacridone red and a um, little bit of quinacridone gold layered in just a dry brush in the back over those buildings. Very simple. Not much to it. So I'm deepening these darks using a lot of ultramarine blue in layers. Remember, always in layers. Now here's a case where the door's on one side of the bridge, but not on the other. So I'm connecting it to the dark of the actual underside of the bridge. Makes it look a little less lost. That great rough pressed paper, a little bit of dry brush. You've got some sparkly stone. You need a little bit of definition, but I don't want too much definition in that bridge. I just want enough so you know what it is. Just a little bit of dark right under those stones makes that stand out. Remember, Venice is old, so it's got things blurred all over the place. There's not the crisp lines on a modern building. Nice strong darks. Now the major problem still with this painting is I've got all warm colors. It's all pretty close to the same value except for the very dark of underneath the bridge and the light of the bridge. Uh, there's lots of sparkly whites everywhere, but it's still just warm and pretty light. I'm going to have to change that pretty soon. I love those little hidden courtyards in Venice. You look through a gate and over a wall and you can just see a hint of there's something green and growing and a beautiful little courtyard to sit in there. It's nice that things are hidden even in a very touristy city. Now I can't let that get too dark or too cool because that is where I'm wanting the warm light area. I'm not trying to do perfect little shutter boxes. I, I don't want that kind of perfection because then it distracts from the rest of the painting. This isn't an architectural sketch. This is a vibrant, active, seen a glance uh, version of Venice. It's not a photo. Photographs are perfect and it's much actually easier to do a perfect photorealistic painting than it is to do a loose, active, energy one. It's a good idea to practice doing some photorealistic paintings to start with. It, it gets you into the, the um, where you can do it. So you, you realize that that isn't necessarily where you're going. I'm just doing some little dashes. There's a lot of um, beautiful moldings and um, all the roof rafters and everything like that. But all I'm really looking for is, hey, there's some detail there and in a little bit there's going to be some shadow. And 
Now it's dried a tiny bit. Gonna warm up the background there. Just dashing some, just putting that very pale, very pale um, layer of quinacridone red over that makes it considerably warmer. But I don't want it too dark. It still needs to be one of the lightest parts of the painting. Some deep shadows. And deep shadows really make that beautiful molding stand out, the marble. Deep shadows underneath. So you really can't see what that is. That looks so dark when I first put it on. But now it's it's kind of, you know, a three or four on the value scale before I start adding more. That's why you add in layers. Because if you add it in one, it'd get heavy and it wouldn't have that translucency. I'm still not entirely sure why lots and lots of layers builds up translucency, but if you do it in one, it just becomes muddy, but that's what happens. Nice strong darks behind this bridge give you a sense of depth. You never know what might be behind those Venice doorways. That gives you a, a destination for your eyes to go. That extreme contrast there, I'm going to have to dull down at some point because um, it's going to pull your eye away from the center of interest. Just dash in lines. Don't worry about having them exact. I want to emphasize the dark of that window, a door, because it really is going to make the bridge come forward. But the below, I, I'm great if that just blurs into the shadows of the bridge. More shadows. I build up the darks in many layers. That is critical to gain beautiful light. Okay, it's dried and I've cooled down the building to the left a little bit. Now I'm going to darken it even more so it's going to be cooler and darker. And then I'm going to have the cool color surrounding the warm light center. This is tricky because if I get rid of all the lights, then um, it doesn't have that sparkle that Venice has. But if I don't calm down some of that contrast it's going to be awful I love splatter painting it's a great way to get some energy into your painting and also get the rough texture of the stucco I love splattering with just a little bit of clean water adds that energy some action deep shadows underneath those wonderful windows It's really nothing like those balcony windows, is there? More splatter paint to get the stucco effect and ancient moldings and everything. A little bit of Quinn gold there. There's barely a hint of the omnipresent um, poles that they tie the boats to. Just enough where you know that people use this bridge for everyday purposes. It's amazing that there's no railing on there, isn't it? All the steps were slanting just ever so slightly down and sideways. So you do have to pay attention. I want a deep shadow because these are deeply carved moldings on the um, bridge. 
but if I draw too much attention, it'll distract. So I'm trying to just use enough darks to frame the area. Some dashes of blues and and just a little bit of dashes pulling some detail. Not much detail because right there is not where I want your eye to go to. And since it's a bridge and it's leading you from point A to point B, your eye could go there very easily. Just drips and drabs, a little bit of just some dark recesses up above the, the gates. Not sure whether they're gates or doors, sort of in between, aren't they? Little touches of shadows underneath those balconies because it's not going to look three-dimensional unless you do have the shadows the buildings are relatively flat but the shadows make it just enough where you know you feel like you're being drawn into it I'm starting to get a little bit deeper in colors there because I can see how much of it. Um, I've done the blue, deep blue cool to the left. So now I can tell, oh, well, I can go this dark on the, the houses in the light area because if I had gone right in, I might have gotten too dark in the houses in the center of interest. I need detail there, but not too much. It's the sparkle and color of Venice. It's not, ooh, I can paint shutters beautifully. Just dashing in the, the water. Um, where there's a little bit of movement on waves, just one little trick is make both sides come to a point. I like doing railings and things like that with the rigger. It's kind of hit or miss. Um, they have such interesting railings there too. Just something really unique. Um, and they're kind of hit or miss. Uh, riggers don't hit everything. Pull those out a little bit more now that I've painted more around there. Have those deep dark shadows at the base, you know, where the waters come up and flooded the first floor for millennia. And it'll be kind of greenish because, you know, algae. I need to pull some of the colors of the buildings down, but I don't want to get too much color too much interest right there. That's more of a path and a path should give you an open area to walk into the painting. Designing a couple darks and a little bit of a railing in there makes all the difference. You're kind of looking under that bridge. Hmm, what could be there? Notice how many whites I've still left in a lot of this. That's what makes the sparkle. 
easy to do on a rough press paper. Okay, see the burger is very hit or miss, and I generally blot it a couple times and play with it also. But it's just enough to give the detail of those really interesting um, railings. Now, I do normally choke up on a brush a little bit. I don't like to get much into the metal part, the ferrule of the brush. But with the rigger, you hold way back. The idea is to kind of flick it around, add some action. You might flick it a little bit more when you're doing tree limbs or something with the jagged strokes, random, than when you're painting intricate um, railings that need to be, you know, more or less symmetrical. But the idea is the same. You don't choke up on a rigger, ever. You won't get the effect you want. A little bit of blotting, and then I'll go back and add a little bit more detail just to have it just right. Just bringing out a couple finishing things makes all the difference. That needs a little bit more emphasis. There's not much left now. A little bit of a railing over there. I wasn't sure if that would distract too much, but... It really does need the railing, right? People would fall in. <laughs> okay. So just a little bit of detail there. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed watching me paint this painting of Venice and it inspires you to paint your own Venice bridge. For more paintings and demonstrations, visit my website at www dot jenniferbranch dot com. Happy painting.